Welcome, everybody. I hope you can see me and hear me loud and clear. Uh, my name is Maria Uotila. I'm the Director of Strategic Alliances of the Northern Growth Zone Strategic Alliance, uh, which is the region in Finland covering most part of the southern Finland um, and covering those regions in Finland that uh, have more than 50% or 60% of Finnish population, GDP, and also jobs, and covering 60% uh, of, uh, of the research and innovation, research development and innovation investments in Finland. And uh, the Northern Growth Zone is also the part of Finland that belongs to the European Union 10 t Scandinavian Mediterranean Core Network Corridor. So it'll give me a, a great position to host this webinar covering the transport corridors and what's going on now that we are in the middle of the pandemic. I'm also a, a board member of the Cars Nordic Association, uh, the association that is uh, organizing this event. Uh, and the Cars Nordic also, you can use when you are um, using the Twitter or other social media, if you would like to uh, tweet something from here, from this event, please use hashtag Cars Nordic, C-A-A-S Nordic. Also, uh, as a practical note, we have uh, Vediafi, uh, LTD, taking care of the practical things regarding this event, and we have uh, Ira, Sarianne, and Alex uh, helping, helping us out on the background. And uh, I'd like to uh, invite you to use the chat or questions and answers uh, boxes at the bottom of the page in case you have any questions or comments or any other remarks <clears throat> during this event. Our event is organized in three sections. After each section, we will take up uh, some of the comments or questions regarding uh, the presentations in each section. And in the first section, we have uh, the expert insights of four esteemed uh, keynote speakers. Then we have three industry presentations uh, covering different modes, different transport modes, and how they have been affected and how they are coping. And after the industry presentations, we still have very short industry pitches from the members of the Cars Nordic Association representing different angles to the uh, logistics field. And uh, we, will be, uh, we will be hearing about the challenges and opportunities on the logistics field. And now we have the page uh, with all the presentations. Thank you. And even if we don't have the crystal ball, which I, uh, I think at least I would like to have a crystal ball uh, looking at the future, then I think that uh, our today's uh, keynote speakers will have the best understanding and uh, insights in what might be there waiting for us in the future as well. As a practice, Practical thing, I will be uh, using this little bell. Sometimes uh, when the time is up for the, for the speakers, if they get too carried away in their speeches. Uh, but I think that if we have uh, uh, the deputy head of unit from the European Commission, DG Move. Uh, Mrs. Annika Kroon, our very first esteemed speaker uh, online, then I would like to uh, invite her to give her very interesting presentation on how on the EU level we now see the situation and how to cope with it and maybe go further. Uh, I think, Annika, the floor is yours. We are very happy to have you here. 
Thank you, Maria. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And Maria, thank you for this kind introduction. So I'm Annika Kron, Deputy Head of Unit of Maritime Transport and Logistics in uh, DGMO, which is a uh, Director General of European Commission dealing with mobility and transport. Thank you for inviting me. Very happy to be here today. Uh, unfortunately, just virtually, I would have loved to come to Tallinn or Helsinki, but it's not possible. And yes, indeed, I'm representing the European Commission here. Uh, so I would like to use this opportunity to speak briefly from the perspective of uh, European Union and European Commission, how the COVID uh, disruptions have impacted the transport system and paradoxically created the momentum for fast tracking digitalization. In, in freight transport. Transport sector was one of the most severely impacted to their major demand shocks during the crisis. And in particular, you all know passenger transport across all the modes, and in particular for aviation, was hit hardest. Uh, freight suffered from interruptions in production and supply chain, but continued to run. There were major problems on roads when uh, uh, countries started in an uncoordinated manner to shut down the borders, but then the commission managed to come out with the green lines communication which eased the situation. And another factor affecting negatively freight transport was that holding passenger services also impacted freight, uh, which was normally carried by planes and ferries. And there, sometimes member states had to put in place additional PSO services and uh, aviation cargo prices went unfortunately up quite significantly. At the same time, what we saw that intermodal transport stood strong, being surprisingly resilient, and terminals were kept open, rail freight uh, continued to run, demonstrated how quick and reliable it actually can be if it does not need to compete for the capacity of its passenger trains. Global shipping was most affected by asymmetric uh, recovery in different parts of the world. And due to that, there was some kind of congestion, uh, yard congestion and storage shortage in ports, but overall still continued to function and maritime has now bounced back quite well. So what we learned, what we learned really is that safeguarding the single market and communication is uh, coordination is really key for the functioning of the economy and transport system as a lifeblood of economy has to become more resilient, which means smarter, more flexible and efficient. This takes me to the next point. As the business as usual was disrupted, we saw a major change, a surge in demand for operational data and digital solution, both at business and policy domain. So if you have to change your routine, you have to take uh, decisions based on what happens one day to another, the data importance of good data is really necessary. Resilience has always been sought in the field of transport. So unless transport system is able to handle change, unless it's flexible and designed well enough to able to foresee and accommodate disruption, there is a danger for, for uh, not being able to meet demand. So COVID brought all these things into spotlight. How can we make sure that transport would be able to adapt and uh, be uh, do so in a fast and efficient manner. And the availability data along the supply chain is key in this regard. That's what you are doing in CAS. So I hope that it also helps your cause. We need data to monitor the situation and adjust and reattribute resources where necessary. And also digitalization is way to overcome from administrative burdens and use better our assets and infrastructure, which becomes increasingly scarce. Uh, but while managing the crisis, we of course also have to keep our eyes up on the horizon. So what happens after what is about to recover? That's why, where I would like to focus and in particular from the digitalization viewpoint. The commission has proposed 750 billion recovery plan next generation EU 
And the question is now, can the recovery address both climate change and the economy? The answer is that we just cannot afford to do otherwise. And digitalization plays a key role in bringing the two together, sustainability and economy. Governments benefiting from recovery funds will have to direct at least 37% of spending to climate and at least 20% on digital. So, Commission work plan for 2021 was adopted last week and it seeks now this balance long, between long term objectives uh, with immediate crisis management and we aim to get our economies going. Um, it's important also maybe to draw your attention that EU transport strategy is coming up at the end of 2020. This strategy is labeled sustainable and smart, and it will set up the pathway for the decarbonization of the transport sector until 2020, 2050. And digitalization again will be a prominent part of it. So, and now really going uh, to the digital area ex exclusively, I would like to start with the EU horizontal data initiatives, which are foreseen to be adopted between now and end of the next year. And these uh, items here focus on data aspects and are in the remit of DigiConnect, which is a different DG, not where I'm working, but a uh, uh, service of European Commission, which sets cross-sectoral policies for communications, net, communication networks, content and technology across all economic sectors, not just transport. But many of these elements have an ele uh, impact on transport area, and therefore I thought that I would share with you what is happening in this uh, regard. All these uh, initiatives have been outlined in uh, common uh, in EU strategy for data, which was uh, put forward in March this year. And first of them uh, is the idea of creating common new data spaces in seven priority areas and transport being one of them. Here you see the other data spaces also health, manufacturing, agriculture, finance and environment and energy. The idea of data spaces is to provide IT capacity, including cloud storage and processing uh, services, and to pull together data from different public and private sources for the common good. The objective is to make data easy to share, and it also aims to ensure that data interoperability between these uh, sectors, uh, between sectoral data spaces. Uh, so the that's about the data spaces. Then Digital Services Act aims to limit the market power of big techs uh, by regulating the rights of data held by these big online platforms, maybe less relevant for this audience. Uh, but then the third one is uh, high quality public data sets, which is to make certain government data accessible for reuse free of charge for SMEs and innovation. This is very common practice to make public data available in uh, northern part of Europe, but not everywhere. So that's where this initiative comes in. And lastly, Data Act, which will tackle better access to and control over data for fair data economy. This is planned for the next year and is something we all need to pay attention to uh, because it tackles business data and code generated data from Internet of Things, both from um, industry and uh, both uh, data coming from industry and individuals. So I would now move on to the policy areas really under the remit of teaching more. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce to you the work of, of the Digital Transport and Logistics Forum. That's the forum which our unit is uh, in charge of, and I'm chairing the plenary meetings of this forum. Uh, and uh, it has two subgroups uh, focusing on implementation of regulation of electronic freight transport information, and the second group looking at the concept of uh, European framework for corridor information system. So 
First, a couple of words about the forum itself. Um, yeah, digitalization in the freight sector will be key to increase our competitiveness and tackle inefficiencies, which we really have to do, because this is the win-win situation for greening and, uh, and uh, restoring economy, because making system more efficient reduces cost and reduce, reduces emissions. Uh, and we have to reduce transport emissions by 90% by 2050 in order to achieve the Paris Agreement targets. This was the underlying idea when the Digital Transport and Logistics Forum was created in 2015, and it gathers about 120 experts, including government representatives, transport and logistics stakeholders, and technology providers along the multimodal supply chain. Uh, DTLF is kind of sounding board and advisor for the European Commission, and also it has helped to bring together this very diverse community of, of stakeholders. And it helps us to think and reflect on standard policies and projects and prioritize the work. And it has been for source and provided input for the regulation of electronic freight transport and the corridor concept, which is very close to cars. And I would now introduce those two concepts separately. But it now, with a being bearing in mind that we have a task to set up also mobility data space, as I explained you earlier, this uh, platform, DTLF, we expect it to also, also to become a provider of concrete technical input. Uh, in this regard, that what kind of data and how we can include or pull together in common mobility data space as regards freight information. So, so first about FT regulation. So conscious of time, I still have some time left. Um, I would introduce in general terms what FT is about and uh, what we aim to do in this regard. The regulation was adopted in August 2020 and the problem it tries to tackle is that uh, for freight transport information in the EU, the framework is patchy and information and documentation that the transport companies are requested to manage and make available to authorities really diverge between the different modes of transport and between member states. Uh, we find that it's unnecessary burden and FD aims to pull these requirements together in a harmonized EU framework for business to administration electronic exchange. So what it means? It does not create any new information requirement, but the aim is to define one common data set that works everywhere in the EU and covers all modes except maritime, which is covered by a different system. But I get back to you later, back to it later. Data will be stored by certified platforms, private service providers, or big companies can get their own system certified. And authorities anywhere have to accept this information made available by these certified platforms and according to agreed predefined functionalities. So the obligation is on the authority side. So FD would allow to digitize major part of freight transport, but it's still a stepwise approach because we, we have to be reasonable to be successful. So obligation is just for authorities, not yet for economic operators, because we had to bear in mind the large amount of SMEs, in particular uh, working on the road sector, and maybe not able to embrace the concept right away. And it does cover only hinterland cargo and not yet maritime, but the system can be expanded to cover also other modes and to be connected to other systems in the future. Yes, this is the timeline. What we hear that the full up implementation application is foreseen for 2025, but we hear 
many sites that it's by far not fast enough. We do our best to speed up. And there are some successful pilots, including in Estonia, Digena, which indicate that it's possible to move quicker at least some parts of Europe. So also briefly about the digital corridor information system concept, which aims to create common set of rules, facilitate interoperability between existing platforms kind of being platform of platforms. The aim is to be able to propose technical specifications and implementation guidelines for such a federated network of platforms by 2022. It's an ambitious task, but based on sectoral demand and developed by the, uh, based on the bottom up input and expertise from uh, the TLF members. And the guiding principles are that it has to be easy to connect independently what system you use or what type of technology you use. It has to be safe, secure and trusted. So we have to consider govern governance framework and the verification and supervision procedures. And it has to be interoperable. We have in place for testing and validation these ideas, the two uh, projects funded from Connected Europe facility. And I, be I believe that Vedia fee is part of the federated project. Yeah, and I'm almost about to conclude. So your success would be our success and we will have an opportunity to be first movers in emerging global trend to have a high tech novel mo freight mobility services. So don't hesitate to contact me and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Kron. Uh, and I'd like to remind everybody that uh, you can uh, use the chat function to comment or, or, or ask questions and we can deal with, the, with them at the end of the uh, fourth speaker in, in the expert insights part of the webinar. But thank you very much. This was very insightful. It's good to know that uh, what's going on on the commission side, was the, what the big picture is, and also that there is uh, substantial funding for these issues that we can cope with. Uh, we'll move on, and I'd like to uh, introduce our next uh, esteemed uh, speaker, Professor uh, Gernot Liedke from Germany. He's the head of department of the research uh, center DLR, and also um, uh, representing the Technical University Berlin. Uh, and he is very much uh, uh, in, he has in-depth understanding of the most recent uh, logistics trends and how the logistics sector, especially in Germany, has been affected by this pandemic. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. In fact, we have conducted several studies and empirical uh, research um, during the crisis um, to see what happens. Uh, but in my presentation, I want not only to show what ha has happened, but also what could be expected on the future with, without really giving a forecast, but to give some ideas what could happen now. So um, yes, and that's my, my presentation. Uh, to, to remind you, uh, as in each European uh, country, uh, there have been several phases of the uh, cor corona pandemic. So it started very quickly with panic reactions from the customers. We had border um, closures. Then there was in all countries a lockdown, lockdown uh, phase. Uh, now we had a lot of relaxations during um, the last months and maybe we are now facing another lockdown down, uh, phase that comes. So in our studies we looked at each phase separately and uh, looked what does, how does this phase affect logistics. So just before uh, the lockdown um, the point was panic reactions by the customers and already at this stage, a tremendous growth of e-commerce because people didn't want to go shopping anymore. 
So this created a very large stress on the supply chains, especially in the re um, in the retail sector and in Germany, it affected uh, hygienic products. In France, it has uh, uh, seems to be affected the um, the um, um, wine and, and other, other segments. Um, we had the first uh, problem of uh, not having truckers anymore, no trucks and no drivers, because some of them uh, were in quarantine uh, already or could not cross uh, borders. Uh, what we saw from logistics, that logistics acted very quickly, efficiently, um, if a shop was running out of um, stocks, then the producers were able to deliver um, the products directly into the shops without going um, through distribution centers or contract logistics networks. I think at this time, logistics did a wonderful job and um, really minimized the negative effects on the customers. Then we had the phase two. Uh, the lockdown period. Um, overall, um, there was a grow uh, in, in some retail segments. Do it, do it yourself markets boomed. Uh, people um, more and more buy products in the living segment. Um, high quality food is more and more demanded by the customers. On the one hand, on the other uh, side, some production sectors came to a standstill, not because they were lacking of supplies, but just demand was broken down and because of the um, uh, regulations uh, for the working uh, spaces, um, so the pandemic um, obligations forced them to, to close production. Um, different uh, things happened in the logistics market. So air freight uh, came to a standstill more or less. And then in the transport markets, we saw different, different things. For instance, the market for the railways imploded, so the containers didn't arrive at the ports. The bulk transports uh, were reduced dramatically. In the parcel delivery segment, uh, B2B came to a standstill, but parcels delivered to private households exploded. Demand of the automotive industry went dramatically uh, down. Um, for in the construction industries, there was a lack of trucks and drivers, on the other hand, because these industries didn't came to a standstill and the um, transport tariffs collapsed because of the general um, reduction of demand. And this was a very strong struggle for the railways. Um, so different um, developments that changed on a day-to-day -day basis during the three months to one month of the lockdown. Um, so we can see this also in the data. In the lockdown phase, uh, there was a reduction of transport demand, freight transport demand of about 14%. It affected more the international truckers than the national carriers because of the um, still ongoing national um, consumption and because of the interruption of the international transport corridors. Uh, but already in June and until September, we had a recovery of the situation and uh, we have nearly the same situation as before. This holds true for the national transports, but also for the international transports. We can also see the situation on the mileage of trucks on the German motorways. Uh, this is our index, which is um, normalized to be 100 for the year 2015. Uh, so we can see just before the crisis, we had 118% of the transport performance as compared to 2015. Then there was the Corona crisis. Uh, then the, we have a recovery phase. And now we are just 5% 
below the level just before the crisis. So we can say, okay, we have nearly recovered um, when we look on the transport volume on the road. So let me give a short interim conclusions. We had struggled in logistics. We had border crossing problems. There were disbalances of supply and demand in different transport markets, and they affected the markets very differently. Uh, logistics did a very good job because they compensated problems that were caused in logistics, in retail, and in consumer behavior. On the other hand, other societal problems, in my point of view, were much more severe and um, turned out to be more relevant from the point of view from politicians. Um, the question arises now, so what? Look, at logistics did a good job. Is this what will come in the future? Um, to give you an outlook to the future, it might make sense to look into the past. And uh, what you can see is the eco economic development um, in OECD countries. Um, since 1960 until nearly today, what we can see is that in the development of GDP, um, we always faced some economic crises. Uh, for instance, the oil crisis or the dot-com dot crisis or the subprime cri crisis in 2008. Um, the crises were triggered in very different ways. For instance, the economic effect of the oil crisis only happened two years after the triggering event. The crisis in 2000, in, in 1993, was a very complex crisis. Uh, it, it had uh, different reasons. Uh, the subprime crisis um, uh, just was triggered uh, after the collapse of uh, the banking system in the United States. Um, but independently, what happens, what is the reason of the crises? One can say economic crises are a fact. And when you look on the situation since 2010, we didn't really experience a very significant crisis. Uh, the GDP development was not very dynamic, but it was not bad in most countries in the Western states. And many people say, OK, it's time for the next crisis. And this is the reason why the markets are very, very uh, let's say nervous, and people do not only look on Corona and uh, the pandemic itself, but also on the economic development as a whole. Let me just focus on the past 10 years. You can see the crisis of 2008. What you can see is the GDP development um, in comparison to the quarter before. So in two total, the surface counts, the integral be below the curve. And one can see the crisis of 2008 has in total had a total effect on GDP of about four or 6%. And only in 2015, we have reached the same GDP level as compared to 2008. The situation in 2020 is quite different because the downturn uh, of economic activity is much higher, much stronger, but we had a very, very quick recovery. At the moment, we are lagging only 5% below the before crisis level, which is the same situation as after 2010. And if the economy recovers a little bit in the following months, one can say, okay, the crisis will have be just been a we, and it can be forgotten in history. It just affected many people in their private lives and careers. But from a global economic perspective, it's just a small we. But I cannot exclude the hypothesis that it will not just be a we, but that economy will be turned down again, and then we could um, face a real economic crisis as compared to 2008 and as compared to some crises before. Other aspects need to be mentioned when looking into the future. 
in many countries with a strong automotive sector. There's an ongoing um, debate what happens with the most significant economic sector, um, giving uh, the fact that more and more electrification uh, will, will become the dominant propulsion in the car industry. Um, there are more and more debates saying that Corona has not triggered the globalization, but may be amplified. We have global warming and external effects also stressing supply chains. And before that background, when looking in the, into the future, you can see the development of German road transport in the past and the predictions to futures are possible. Either we have a V-shaped development also on freight of freight transport, or we will have a second development as compared to 2008. And this needs to revise our freight transport forecasts in the future. After having uh, talked uh, so much about crisis and future crises, let me say that a crisis is always a chance for the future, especially for the core area in the Scandria region. We must mention that there is a new economic cluster of electronic car industry. It gives many chances for the local labor in the markets, but also the logistics area here. We have to mention a crisis also as a change that digitization becomes forward, logistics platforms, data sharing platforms. We have to see that the land bridge is booming despite the crisis, but there are no, no airplanes anymore. And it, it is a chance for railway transport. And we have to revise our visions for autonomous driving and new mobility service in private transport too. Thank you for your attention. And I know I have to save time in the first part of about three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Liedke, for this very insightful uh, presentation on the on the industry in general. Uh, and I remind you that uh, you can use, use the chat function to, uh, to any comments or questions and we'll, uh, we'll be able, able to uh, present them at the, at the break quite soon. But next uh, we have uh, our esteemed uh, guest speaker from uh, the European Parliament. So I will welcome uh, Henna Virkunen, who is also a member of uh, the Transport Committee in the European Parliament and will have uh, very interesting topics uh, regarding this, this uh, pandemic theme as well. So the floor is yours. And I understand that uh, you don't have any slides, so uh, uh, you are welcome to present them. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Maria, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me well. We didn't test this connection, but uh, it seems that you, you can hear me. Good, good. I'm going to speak about the smart mobility and connectivity in post-pandemic Europe. And uh, as we heard already from the presentations, and, and you know it very well, the pandemic came as a shock for many industries in Europe, and not least for the transport and freight sector with borders closed and mobility hindered by obstacles that few could have imagined in a year ago. So it was very, very strange situation where we were in the spring. But as the pandemic situation has prolonged and we have gotten past the first shock, it seems that the sector has shown its ability to adapt like we heard from the presentation just before that. So this all shows that there is a functioning European market in log logistics that adapts very quickly to changes in demand. I think when we speak about smart mobility and connectivity, in many ways, uh, the COVID-19 has made the transition towards smart and sustainable mobility harder, I think. And uh, the main reason for that is the lack of resources that follows from the economic crisis. Many governments and also companies, they will find it hard to put together the financial resources for investments. But in the same time, a crisis is also 
always a chance for renewal, as we know. If we are bold enough to invest in emerging digital technologies and not just to preserve the old, the pandemic can serve as a stepping stone towards smart and sustainable mobility, I think. Because anyway, even during the corona crisis, we know that mobility is necessity. People and goods, they are moving more than ever. And this trend will continue in the future. Before the pandemic, it was estimated that passenger transport will grow by more than 40% by 2050 compared to 2010, whereas freight transport is expected to grow even more by 60% by 2050. As a result of the pandemic, these estimates, they may change, of course, and the modes of transport may not be the same as we anticipated, but anyway, the increasing need for mobility and transport, that will remain, I think. Before the pandemic hit, there was also two clear mega trends in the mobility and transport sector. One was reducing emissions, decarbonization of transport. That was one big mega trend. And the next one was uh, boosting the digitalization of transport and mobility, which in turn enabled intelligent transport and also increased automatization. The pandemic may have altered the course of these mega trends, but the drivers behind them are still the same. There is still pressing need to make transport more safe, clean, sustainable, multimodal, and also more efficient. Digitalization and automatization offer great opportunities for this and can boost competitiveness of European industry. So you are playing very important role on this, our competitiveness. And because of this, I see that the pandemic is temporary bump that will certainly change the trajectories in this field, but not the big picture itself. Smart mobility and concepts such as cars are increasing in importance also in the post-pandemic world. Development towards smart and sustainable mobility is not going anywhere, quite the contrary. At the same time, many if the hurdles that are hindering the development of smart mobility are still the same. There is still a lot we need to do in order to facilitate these services and technologies in the European level and also in the member states. We need integrated infrastructure, planning, better charging infrastructure, 5G and Galileo services to facilitate communication between vehicles and infrastructures. And uh, definitely we need more investments in this field. We need to invest more in fast connections that are vital for the deployment of uh, CITS and CAS. And the European Commission has estimated that 500 billion euros investments are needed to reach our connectivity objectives in the EU. And right now I'm very worried that the investments currently deployed, they will come nowhere near to meeting these demands. We know that now when we are planning the recovery plans in uh, different member states, uh, Green Deal and digital economy, they are supposed to be the priorities. So I hope that we are also investing enough to these smart and fast connections all over in, in Europe. And uh, when we speak about logistics and uh, freight transport, uh, it's important to also mention uh, one thing, a big, big change uh, during the pandemic, because I think it has been also some kind of wake up call to Europe about our resilience as a total, because um, I think it will be the area which will be increased uh, or the focus will be more in the post pandemic Europe is the, is the dependency, dependency of USA and Asia with regards to many raw materials and critical components. And this is uh, very close, of course, when we are speaking about freight transport and logistics, because we know that today global production chains, they are very long and often not transparent even to companies themselves. In Europe, many companies, they have been forced out of business as usual as a result of the crisis due to shortage of components 
with restrictions of mobility around the world, bringing long production and logistics chains to a halt. A few years ago, with the onset of electric car boom, it became clear that Europe, which has been always very proud of our car industry, is completely dependent on Asia, if we are speaking about battery production. But now this pandemic, they has, it has shown that this dependency exists elsewhere in the mobility domain as well. So nowadays in Europe, when we are speaking about our industry strategy, uh, the role of resilience is underlined very much. I think there is no point in striving to full self-sufficiency, but Europe should be able to ensure the continuity in critical production, even in various exceptional circumstances. The pandemic crisis is a big lesson. It is certain that as a result of this crisis, also global production chains will change. And I think um, uh, you already has realized it in, in your work in logistics. And at last uh, point uh, in my short presentation is uh, uh, digitalization and data. Because now when we are speaking about uh, boosting the digitalization, we know how crucial the data is for these innovations on, on this field. And there are many questions to be solved regarding the access and ownership of data still in Europe. Open data is a key to make digitalized mobility services function seamlessly. And cybersecurity is also an essential challenge to be tackled as a transport system becomes more digitalized and connected. I think that the European Union can, and in my opinion also should, set global standards for big data and artificial intelligence and automatization. In this regard, I have very high expectations, expectations for Commission's legislative initiatives to be published at the end of this year and in 2021. So they are connected to data and also to artificial intelligence, which are crucial also when we are speaking about transport and mobility. We have to make sure that these new regulations, that they are innovation friendly, that they are not setting new obstacles for innovations. It's important not only to encourage innovation, but also give long time perspective and legal certainty to entrepreneurs and investors. So that's why I think it's important when we are speaking about regulation, like we are always when we are speaking about European Union, we have to take care that we are not over-regulating the things, that we are creating innovation-friendly regulatory framework. And in, in the same time, we should be very technology neutral because we know that te technology is developing very, very fast and the legislation process is very, very slowly. So we should have that kind of regulation that really boosts the innovations and uh, investments on, on this field. And also, I think as Europe as whole, we need to be, we should be a place where new ideas and innovations, they can flourish. We have to ensure that Europe will be the leader of connected and automated driving in the future. And that's the work what we are now doing in the European Parliament. And I'm very happy that you, as stakeholders, you have been very active in this process because we really need you also your ideas and experiences that we can make a good uh, legislative phrase, uh, framework. And of course, that we can also find the uh, right tools uh, and instruments also to support financially these new innovations. So thank you for this possibility to take a part of this interesting webinar. Thank you, Henna Virkunen, for this insightful uh, presentation and very important points, and especially the last one that uh, uh, carries us uh, further in, in our uh, quest for better lo logistics and better innovations as well. Uh, next. Uh, we have uh, uh, the last expert insight presentation, after which we have uh, a short break and some questions if needed. Uh, we have uh, Päivi Wood. She's the senior advisor at the Finland Chamber of Commerce currently, but she has long uh, background uh, in Brussels uh, 
for instance, in the permanent representations of representation of Finland in Brussels, and also background in the Ministry of Transport and Communications in Finland. And currently, she's responsible for transport and regional and industrial policies at the Finland Chamber of Commerce. But uh, we are very happy to uh, welcome you, Baivi. Baivi Wood, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation as well. This topic is actually really, really interesting and very up to date as well. So. Thanks for this. Um, we have actually repeated in Finland time after time all those years that I remember that Finland is an island. And this outbreak of the virus that started last spring actually showed us on a very, very clear way where we are on the map, if that was ever a question to anyone, but then what it means when the transport system and the transport flows outside of our borders as well are being disrupted. So um, uh, I work in the Chamber of Commerce, which is representing 20,000 20, companies in Finland. We have 19 chambers all around Finland. So it is fair to say, I think that we have a very good overview of the situation across Finland. Finland is not only Helsinki and as well as the member companies that we have from the very small ones to the big ones who actually act on the, the global market. Um, it, it goes without saying that the outbreak itself of the virus affected to our member companies in many different ways. And there was a difference in time as well. You know, some companies were affected from the very, very beginning when China started coughing in the beginning of the year But then for some companies, the, this uh, situation only became reali reality late, late spring. Um, but what I would like to, to bring up is that what was important was that there were some common factors for, for our members and for the companies in Finland. Um, but then what did we do? And most importantly, what are the lessons that we, we learned? What could we do better in the future? Because the, the most important issue here is that we need to ensure the smooth traffic flows as well as the connectivity of Finland to the rest of the world. So some issues that were in common for, for the companies was that we were all a bit puzzled. What is the, there was a huge uncertainty about the scale and the continuation. Now, when we look back, we, we know a lot more, but we did not know this when this all started. Then the second issue is that when this all started, this was only about fire fighting. That became the reality for the companies. And that means also that the development of the activities that they are doing or were doing needed to be put aside And the question here for the future is that how long, how long will we be doing this being on a survive mode? Because we need to be ready also to develop the activities and then face the future challenges, one of them being decarbonization. Then the third issue was that what are the measures that are going to be taken in terms of legislation? All At, at national level, but also at the European level. And I think it's fair to say that the, the measures that were taken at European level were uh, vital for Finland. We had a lot of worry about the connectivity and how the cargo will actually flow in the beginning of the crisis. And um, that was in the chamber as well. We were, I can say, utterly worried about how this all can be guaranteed and It, it's not only about, you know, if we have the bananas in the shops, but it was about the, the components of the com to the companies as well who are producing items. And then overall, it was about the flows, which are vital for the Finnish economy. Um, and of course, taking into account where Finland is located, when the movement of, of people were restricted, it became evident that we are so dependent on, on air and sea connectivity. And that became a bit of an issue because we, we can look back and say that um, 
Finnair was flying, was it 90% less than normally? So, of course, the cargo within the, the stomach of the plane, that, uh, that decreased a lot as well. Um, so, two big questions we had. How will the cargo flow and what needs to be done? And then secondly, and this is not, this is, I would say, super important as well. How will the transport companies carrying the passengers, how will they survive when people are not moving any longer? And here I need to say that the chamber strongly, very strongly advocates that all the restrictions that we do to the movement of people, they need to be lined up here in Finland also with the EU ones. We are acting in a single market, so we need to have common rules within Europe as well. And actually, I think that this would be the right moment to give credit to the European Commission as well, as in the first presentation, um, Annika went through all the measures that the Commission took from the very beginning of the crisis. And I need to say that they, they nothing is perfect, but they were good enough to keep the cargo flowing and the internal market of the union functioning. And then last point, and this is a bit what worries me at the moment, is that how, we, how will actually the companies survive? And this is especially now we have given in the transport sector financial support for aviation and maritime, but that's not the entire supply chain what we are having. Those are not the only transport forms that are, are active. Um, so the biggest outcomes this far was that the connectivity was not really in danger, but there were severe um, sort of signs that it might be. And that is the red line, the absolute red line for the functioning of that the transport system functions and the, the goods are flowing. And we need to take into account that if we think about this whole thing, and this is not to say that health issues would not be important. That is the most important thing. But nearly 50% of the Finnish GDP actually comes from exports. So we need to make sure in every single situation now and in the future as well, that the transport corridors, the connectivity and the smooth flows of cargo are ensured. Um, and we need, the, we need the connectivity now, but we need the functions as well when we are ramping up again, perhaps to the, should I say, not going back to the old normal, but when, when the situation is getting better. And here it's, it's perhaps the, the most important thing is that Finland needs to see herself as, as part of a bigger picture, as part of the logistical chains, not only with the other member states, but with the other neighbors as well. So what did we learn? Um, everything started really, really fastly. And there was a bit of a panic mode, not only in Finland, but the rest of the world as well. Um, I would say that we, we did learn that uh, Finland is part of the European single market. And, and Finland is, should I say, the bank account of the state of Finland and, and the overall you know, financial situation here is that we, we do a lot of money by being part of the single market. And therefore, it means that our companies, when they are functioning on the single market, we need to ensure, first and foremost, that they have access to those or that market. And um, I could say that you know, now, first time ever in Finland, the um, a 12 year transport planning is being introduced. And as part of that plan, we, it's not only that we need to see how we decarbonize transport, which is really important at the system level, but we need to ensure the connectivity within Finland. We still have a very large territory and not so many people living in here, but we also need to look at the connectivity outside of our borders. Then the next issue is that uh, we need to pay more attention in the future uh, to the resilience of our transport network. We need to have resilient transport system that are ready to face the challenges, whatever they may be in the future. It's not only about today, it's about tomorrow as well. Uh, then, as Henna mentioned in, in her intervention, um, logistical chains, they are 
very complex and interconnected. The companies may not even have idea because they are not transparent. So the message would be to the companies that please have plan B. If, if this happens again, one way or another, and the, the normal functions are being disrupted. And it, this is very important, especially now when, when the stocks of the companies are kept really low and there, there isn't much room to maneuver in that sense. And then I would like to say also that this time was different. When we saw the, the fall down of the towers or SARS epidemia, this is different now. This impacted the whole system everywhere, not at the same time exactly, but more or less at the same time. One factor is that the ro role of China has been growing fastly and many companies have their supply chain start from there. And if we have a major hiccup there, then the companies might need to think how or rethinking a bit their activities as well. What, what is the plan B there? And we are living sort of in the eve of Brexit as well as we've been living for a long time now, but that will impact the Finnish companies as well. And trade wars is, might be, hopefully not, but might be part of the same game. So my message here is that we need to have transport networks that are in good condition. And that is taking action today. We can't just, you know, postpone it to the future. But at the same time, now when we are still doing a bit firefighting, we need to keep clearly in our minds that whatever we do, however we recover from this, we need to, when we restore and we, we strengthen the European single market, and we need to develop that further as well. And at the core of this one, we have mobility. It, it needs to be ensured by investing in roads, sea, rail, air connectivity, because without transport, we actually don't have any possibility for sort of, would I say, effective and, and growing internal market. So we, we should be starting, you know, we should have as our priority to remove the existing bottlenecks within single market and that that's along the same lines what, what Henna said as well. And then I might say that the most important one is that we, we reinforce the freedom of movement, both goods and services and people as well as capital. So lastly, but not least, is that in the middle of all this crisis, our transport companies, uh, they, they still need to tackle the uh, issue of, of decarbonization of, of transport. Some companies are on the survive mode now, but at the same time, it is vital that they get sort of fit for the future as well. And I would hope that we have the wisdom in Finland to take actions, actions that have the biggest impact which are the most effective ones. And we need to take decisions that actually affect the emissions of transport as well, not to take decisions which decrease the amount of transport, for example, taxation, which is lowering the amount of transport, not, but not really in the end, then lowering the emissions. And I do believe that companies, they are the ones who are making the change and are at the core of solving the, the environmental issues as well. So what they need from the side of legislation is a bit of predictability, to the ability to, to see where we are going tomorrow. So I could actually conclude here saying that this has been a challenge and we survived. We survived perhaps, I don't know, well, I don't have anything to compare to since this is a unique situation, but we must remember that this is also opportunity. And what, what are the opportunities that we should take? Uh, we need to green transport. We need to reduce the risks, especially for a place like Finland, which is isolated. We need to see, do we have plan B? How can the company still function if something like that 
all on the same scale happens again. And we need to increase the resilience of our transport system. And also, I do believe that there is a need to develop tools, tools that are common within Europe, that we can actually increase the digitalization of transport. And that is not the end game, but that would serve as, as a tool to green the transport sector and for the better functioning of the single market as well. And as said, you know, mobility is the necessity in the, in the single market as well. So in the end, I think Finland did well in this acid test for connectivity. It was, you know, not ever, ever something that we wanted, but, you know, one way or another, it was, we did well. But what we need to do now is that we need to make sure for the future that this applies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen Baywood. Uh, this is very insightful as well. Um, I'm very happy to close now the expert insight part of, of our webinar. And do we have some questions to the four speakers that we've just heard of? Questions or comments, maybe? You can put them, write them uh, in the chat box or maybe ask for, ask, ask for uh, a possibility to, to present the questions. I think that uh, one of the one of the one of the most important things here, uh, among many many important things, uh, is the question of, question of resilience. And it's a it's a big word and it's an important word. But resilience might mean different things to different uh, transport sectors or different players as well. Uh, and it's really uh, in, an important question: how to increase or strengthen the resilience of the transport networks. Uh, and how to help help um, uh, the sector to adapt to any black swans that might be around the corner that we don't know of. Uh, so maybe my question would be if there are any not not any other questions, uh, if there are any um, um, any ideas how to strengthen the resilience. I know it's a big question uh, question or too large a question, but. If, if there are any uh, uh, any any tricks that you might uh, like to share with us, then that's my my question. Yes, and there's one question uh, related to the presentations, and uh, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned in the beginning that the the, uh, the recording of this event will be available in YouTube later on. Correct me if I'm wrong. So everything will be uh, available afterwards as well. But does, does anyone want to uh, reflect on the question of resilience? How to, how to do the trick? How to strengthen it? I can, I can try, Maria, but it's, uh, of course, very on the very political, political level, because I think this is something what we are now discussing very much in different committees in the European Parliament about the resilience and in different sectors, what does it mean? And uh, it's true that uh, everybody thinks it a little bit different way, but I think uh, we have to do that, that work in the, of course, in the European level, that we can't be too dependent on some critical materials, for example, that we have to uh, make sure that uh, also if there is that kind of uh, uh, restrictions like there have been now during the last months that we can anyway survive in Europe that and we are not facing uh, too big challenges in that kind of situation. But I think this is also work that all the uh, companies they have to do that are they they have to really uh, evaluate that are they too dependent in, in one customer or in, in one direction and uh, what what is the resilience of, of the company for example in yes. that kind of circumstances so I think we have to do that work in in all the level and I think this pandemic it will it will change this logistic uh, change also in in the global level but also I think in in Europe and also maybe in the member states so I think that is something that all the industries are very much trying to find out that uh, how how well they are prepared for that kind of risks. 
Exactly. Thank you. And Professor Liedke has also. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank during, you. during our interviews, we have seen um, how much logistics is still working via telephone and, and how much personal networks count. So this means um, when it comes to dig digitization uh, and new automatic solutions, we should not forget, let's say, this human factor, the question of qualification of the staff, because this, these are people that have learned logistics 20, 30 years ago. They, they know uh, how, how to organize something in, in a new way. And if people do only act with standardized, standardized systems, restricting their degrees of freedom to act, then logistics is not resilient. So the yes. digitization together with a human factor um, is crucial in my point of view. Very good point. This, this has to be uh, kept in mind as well. Very good. Um, Mario, if I have... Yes, then screw. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, it has to be tackled at different level, at policy level, at strategic level, uh, at operational level. Also, I think we need a plan. We need to plan uh, in expectations of possible black swans, in a sense that everyone also at state level and company level, we need contingency plans. Uh, that's something we also intend to tackle uh, in our uh, teaching move. Uh, and we've got the mandate from German presidency to do so the next week. Next year, we will look into the, let's say, transport system level contingency plan and what is how to ensure that we have uh, effective communication networks and what has to be done at EU level, what national level, and what company level. And we have to keep these plans alive, not to forget it. If we haven't seen a crisis for a couple of years, they, they have to be there to be better prepared for next time. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is very important to keep in mind as well. That's good to hear. I wonder if uh, anyone else has uh, a question or comment on these issues. And if not, uh, I suggest that we have a roughly five minute or four minute break, and then uh, we'll uh, continue at 20 past two finish time uh, with industry presentations. And then we hear how the different uh, transport modes have been affected and what kind of ways they, they uh, are looking forward to, to cope with uh, such a situation in the future. And maybe uh, a crystal ball somebody might have uh, a crystal ball as well, I'm hoping. So uh, we'll return after a couple of mini minutes with the industry uh, present presentations. I think this question is really important, uh, uh, written by Lasse Nykänen uh, to the chat about the um, possible funding that would be steered towards the digitalization of cross-border logistics corridors as logistics is never or in a global scale it's uh, the logistics corridors or logistic chains uh, typically are cross-border so will there be some uh, specific funding uh, targeted to to these issues i don't know the answer but if we have somebody who has has any insights on this, then we'd be happy to hear. Uh, on my side, maybe. Be... Yeah. Um, the next Connecting Europe facility, which is uh, to support transport infrastructures, when the current program was mostly focused on physical infrastructure, then the digital element in the new program has been planned to become, become much more important because we see that it's not just the brick and mortar that counts, but we also have to take care of the digital part. So I imagine that that's the part where we can get funding for that. And there is also a separate program for digital um, Europe on the DigiConnect uh, remit. And I'm not at the moment so aware how this program will be set up, but I think the ideas should be put forward by DigiConnect by the end of this year. And I imagine that this program will definitely support different digital solutions, development of data spaces, including mobility data space, 
plus different uh, regulatory sandbox type of initiatives to see how we can advance with experimental ideas. So let's have our sights on those elements. And I hope that we get support also for cross-border logistics corridor. Very good. Thank you very much for this, uh, this answer to the question. I'm quite sure that we'll keep, keep an eye on these uh, uh, developments on the Commission side. Very good. And now I think uh, that the 10 minutes break that we promised has, has, uh, has gone. And we'll move to uh, our industry presentations covering the different modes of, of uh, transport. And the first one uh, I'm happy to uh, invite uh, is Mr. Jaakko Nirhamo, who is the sales director and uh, uh, deputy managing director of, of the port of Turku, situated on the Fenty Ganmed core network corridor. Uh, the floor is yours, Jaakko. Hello, can you hear me all? Okay, uh, good afternoon for everybody. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately. I can promise you that if I had, I wouldn't be here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, but the next uh, 50 minutes, I will tell you um, about my statement, which you can see over here. You can hear my point of view and, and why I'm saying so. So, but a few words about my employer, Port of Turku. Uh, we, are, we are not the biggest uh, port in, a, in a Finland. Uh, we are something like our, our cargo turnover is uh, something like 2.2 tons annually. And all the ports in Finland are very small. Uh, we have about 2,000 calls per year, 3.1 uh, million passengers annually. Uh, and uh, what about uh, the disruption of, of, of COVID? Uh, the, in this year, we will have something like 1 million passengers. So very, very uh, big degrees of, of, of that kind of that segment. But uh, in the freight segment, uh, we have uh, something like 16% increase because of COVID. Uh, and uh, that's how we are doing this year. Uh, some of, of, the, of the attendees uh, or participants don't know where, the, where is town called Turku. So uh, as Mario told in, his, uh, in her opening words, uh, Turku is located in a triangle of growth in Finland. And you can see in my presentation these numbers, so I, I, I'm not going to repeat them again, but uh, so, just simplify that, that the most of the uh, economy uh, activity is happening in this area. Uh, Turku uh, has a long history of, of, of uh, port industry, so our port is, is, is more than 800 years old. And uh, actually, not many knows that uh, the sea voyage from EU ports is, is shorter to Turku than Helsinki. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, as Paivi said, uh, Finland is an Iceland. And 80% uh, of our uh, <clears throat> foreign trade goes by the sea. So it's, it's the connectivity is, is very important. Uh, from Turku, in, the, in this big picture, you can see our liner services uh, on the left hand side. And, uh, and of course, uh, the world is open via these ports all over the world. Uh, Turku is also part of the Tenti. Uh, network and uh, as you can see the, the seaports on the map and, uh, and the, the whole 10 t network in, in EU area. Uh, also uh, we are essential part of the uh, ScanMed corridor. Uh, on the left hand side you can see the newest report from May 2020 uh, and uh, 
and uh, you can see the in the map the northern part of of the Scandinavian Mediterranean corridor. The next slide is not that um, good, but uh, you can see the whole network, and you can read it uh, more more precise information from the from the report. And you can see what is the what is going on in in, in this corridor uh, at the moment and in the future. Uh, what we are expecting here in, in Finland that uh, uh, and, and in Turku that, that that we will get the intermodal transportation back in Finland. Uh, we don't have today uh, it, but uh, we used to do it. Uh, more than 10 years and uh, some development money is, is needed to, to, be, to start it between uh, Turku and Oulu and uh, if we can find a suitable, suitable uh, uh, partners for that uh, you can open this uh, line even uh, tomorrow. It, it will be uh, a sustainable and smart system which we used to we we, we should also uh, do here in Finland okay uh, some remarks about covid-19 um, and I and I as, as I said my statement uh, 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 some remarks uh, so this this uh, virus, of course, has made people careful, more careful, and, and and learn us how to live in uncertain certainty. Uh, what is happening in the labor market? Of course, it, it, it's expected that there will be more more uh, unemployment, means less consumption and, and less activities, and of course, this this will affect in the future. Now, I have noticed that some people and most of the people uh, uh, would like to uh, do certain and, and familiar practices and acts because they feel safe and secure. Although, although we are all the time learning new and uh, which was uh, normal, up, abnormal before is, is the new normal. So, so we are changing our way of, of working, of doing, of, of buying and, and everything. Uh, this uncertainty is, is how long this will last. The resilience, which has pronounced many, many times in this, in, in the, let's say, people are thinking how to survive, how, how can I adapt, uh, how, how do I see things? Uh, what kind of attitude uh, is, is because of this uh, COVID-19? So, but uh, what, what will happen is that uh, in, in the world, in the national level and local level, economy is suffering, of course, and uh, in the future, there is no funds for everything. So we have to concentrate on cornerstones, what is essential? Uh, what is essential? And uh, I say that, uh, and, and my statement is that the chosen development targets like uh, TNT and the other corridors will strengthen. Uh, you can see from the report that uh, there, there, uh, the developments in the, was, was what was has been the past and the future. But there will be a, a, a more of them, uh, like uh, EU level INAIS, uh, innovation and net, networks executive agencies is, is doing good job. Uh, there has been safe transport calls for more for TNTs for ScanMed. So so and uh, according our sources, uh, there might be a new call for uh, for funding. Uh, before uh, next January, 
so let's see what what will happen is is our uh, agent let's say say is his information correct correct but this corona of course is the beginning of the new of way of thinking and acting like some futurologists have said that this is the time out for humankind uh, i think uh, the big thing will be the new uh, coming movie a life of our planet by uh, sir david attenberg so so that that's is something where people i think will stop think stop to think uh, uh, what are we doing for this planet and that's what will affect for many many ways uh, we have heard and seen that patriotism and protectionism will uh, change the play and roles for all the time uh, i've noticed that green thinking because becomes green acting for instance, here in Finland today, 25% of new cars are either electric or hybrid. Uh, people here in Finland are changing their heating systems from oil to, to heat pumps or, 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 or more greener technology, like solar, solar panels and things like that. And one further logistics said that, uh, that uh, maybe there will be a new way of defining GDP, uh, new measures for growth and well-being. The well-being will be the new element. So will there be, a, 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 in that calculation for, formula, a, a, a new sustainable multiplier? So we, when we are calculating the GDP, uh, we also uh, think and take the sustainability more strongly on it. Okay, now my presentation, okay. But um, how do we, it's not the crystal ball, but that, that's what we all, all know that we need for real time, fact-based and transparent information sharing and systems. Uh, today, I have seen some shooting star in the sky, uh, but they, they uh, exist rarely. There might be something which I, I haven't seen, I don't know, but uh, still we are working uh, quite old fashioned way uh, with the information sharing. So a little bit simplified, uh, before COVID, uh, information was not flowing or shared evenly, only shootings shooting star in the sky as i said uh, some systems uh, last week in in one seminar one metal uh, manufacturer uh, showed a uh, system and it, that was uh, something like which i would like to see in the future but still too many missing links exist for instance in in, in border crossing changes of actors in supply chain and there are too many separate systems instead of one or, or system combination of systems which is visible and in, informative for all. So after, after, okay, after uh, COVID-19, hopefully it will end someday, we will see new kind of material and information flowing and data, data sharing. And uh, my statement is that it will start on the chosen targets like TNT and corridors, because these are the ones who are going to get funding and resources to develop such. Sorry. So system have to shake hands not, not uh, used as a, as a separate systems. And uh, then there is, is this e-buying. Uh, so distribution centers will locate themselves uh, 
on the corridors or, or, or nearby the corridors to get uh, good access on these. So this is how we are acting now. This is something which we which I look, would like to see in the future. And my statement is sharing is caring of environment, economy, supply chain, partners, especially your clients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jarko uh, on, on your insights. And I must say that uh, what you were requesting here or uh, seeing in your crystal ball, the need for real-time fact-based transparent information uh, sharing, that's exactly what the CAS Nordic Association has been formed for. So uh, corridor as a service and all these issues are something that are very much in, in our, uh, uh, our interest. And, and we hope to um, hope to reach that target or those target targets together because it's not for one uh, one player or one industry alone. It's it's for the benefit of the whole ecosystem. In fact, so thank you, thank you very much. And uh, now we are thank moving uh, to another uh, uh, transport mode, uh, namely air, and we have the honor to. Uh, invite Mr. Frederick Wildgrube, who is the head of global sales at, at least for this week. And then, uh, then uh, he has uh, uh, another uh, great position coming up. But uh, uh, this week he will be the head of global sales at Finar Cargo. And uh, I, we welcome Frederick. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Could you give me a signal that my voice is coming through OK? Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Mario Watila. I'd like to thank also the organizers for this amazing opportunity to have the possibility to come and uh, share my views and present uh, my, my presentation here today. Uh, at the same time, I'd like to also thank all the other speakers for today for highly interesting presentations. Thank you very much. Um, like my uh, uh, or the previous speaker, uh, I do not exactly have a crystal ball, but I do have a few of the thoughts about the future, that what we can see, we learn from our history, and sometimes we can uh, use those data points where we've been to probably understand a bit at least where we go. Um, I will be conscious of time. I will move into the presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. My name is Fredrik Wildgrube, and... Um, uh, I am the head of global sales, uh, like uh, Mario so kindly informed. As the start of uh, next week, I will be heading the Finnair Cargo organization as a new position. Um, I will very quickly um, uh, brief you in, 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 into what I'm about to, 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 to present here today. So I will give you a, a focus of the Finnair Cargo organization that is a part of, of, of Finnair Group. Uh, I will have a few words about Finnair Cargo as a part of a few words about memory lane or on the, during the memory lane that we had post COVID-19. I will also describe how it went on to being a center of action as we were in the midst, uh, um, a very present about the COVID-19 and then also some, some thoughts about the post COVID-19 times and what that could provide or limit the logistics, supply chain and procurement elements. So moving forward, um, we have all been talking very heavily about COVID-19 today. And um, we've, we, we see in the news and also um, 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 mainly in the public domain that also a vaccine is starting to become available. Um, I do want to... Um, and um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, and I do want to share the, the, the note that we as Finnair are ramping up our capabilities uh, in order to take part in to the COVID-19 vaccine distribution. Um, and as a basis of our capabilities, um, I do did want to share with you that we were the first airline in the world to have the IATA governed CEIV pharmaceutical certificate. And we are compliant both as an airline and also as our hub functions in Helsinki Bantar. Uh, airport.
there we go. Uh, we do operate the northern route as well. And uh, there is another, another product which is very high demanded of fast connections, and that is, of course, seafood. Um, that's an item that I will address a little bit, a bit, a bit, a bit later on, but it's been a central ingredient of our, uh, of, of, our, of our transportation as we have been moved into the COVID-19 time and also prior to that and hope to keep it as a, as a, as a, as a special product also beyond. As you come to see, I'll be moving quite quickly. This is what the world looked like before we entered into the COVID-19 era. We had 20 destinations, I mean, we still do, but it's, we're not flying to each and every one of them. Um, we are utilizing the brand new and modern aircraft, the A350 extra wide body that does have 25% less emissions. Sustainability has been something that we've been uh, echoing in, in, in many of the, of, of, the, of the presentations today. And I do want to emphasize, do we as Pinna do, do hold this very dear as well? Um, moving actually back to the past slide, um, the previous speaker, Jakob Nerham, was very kind to display where Turk was, and I also took the liberty to display where our home hub is. There it is in Finland, right at the top of the world. Um, as the strategy is very much built around our geography, so our hub, I do want to recognize a couple of points. Uh, we have a unique opportunity for our efficient fleet rotation. So in the majority of all of our destinations in Asia, we can actually move from our hub to Asia and back within 24 hours with one aircraft. And this is actually quite amazing. This allows us to use less equipment to travel the same distance. It allows shorter travel at times for our passengers and cargo to the final destination. And at the same time, it does pose less emissions. So I, I, I do want to emphasize what um, Annika Kron mentioned earlier there in the presentation. That can we actually do both now we are trying to move out from the COVID-19 era? Yes, we can. We can decide how we are going to fly, for instance. So the transportation routes is something that is definitely up to our grasp. So we can impact. This is one of our modern investments in addition to the aircraft. Um, this is Meet Cool, everybody. This is the Finnair Cargo new, brand new terminal that was opened in 2018 and is run like a factory, all possible by data. We did one of the first airlines also in the world that we integrated our cargo management system and also our WMS, so our warehouse management system. So there's no interactive, full or, or automatic transformation of, of data between the two systems, there is no manual intervention, etc., and it allows actually our terminal to be operated like a factory. I have a few of the pictures from the bowels of the terminal right there in the middle of the left hand side. You can see one of the robots that is fully automatic. Um, if anybody asks me, and don't tell anyone our head of operations, that is this run by data or, or by IT or operations? Well, it's a tie, I would say. And there on the right hand side, you have a glimpse of our operational control center. And uh, we practically have a full visibility of all the movements of our network 24-7, uh, even during Christmas Eve. Some of the key figures, now this is a busy slide, and I do want to note that I mentioned about fresh fish and seafood there earlier. In a normal condition, we have up to 100 tons every day of seafood that is moving through our network which is actually quite an impressive number. This is 365 days a year. Now during COVID-19 times, this has been cut by half. But there are some other cool features in the presentation as well, like our dedicated sections in our terminal. You can see there 3000 square meters for pharmaceuticals, dedicated space, non-contamination risk together with perishables where we have fresh items. They are Im embedded into their own sections, full th flow through terminals, which means that we want to safeguard the integrity of the product itself. And um, medicine and fresh food, they do not mix. And this is something that we want to emphasize. Moving forward, I did mention sustainability, and this is definitely something that we have as a very high ground as well. So even our terminal is BREAM certified. It was one of the first terminals in the world that actually had a BREAM certificate. We were noted to have very good status. Um, that was the verdict. We, amongst other things, we have 1,200 solar panels on the roof that actually provide approximately 10% of the terminal energy um, as the energy source. 
we have automated ULD storage, so loading unit. This is the equipment that we use as we uh, load cargo on 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 a, on, a, um, on a device, which is then moved into the aircraft itself. We are located very close to wide body stands, which means that we actually have a beach property, uh, for the lack of a better term, which means that the tarmac time next to the next to the actual aircraft wide body stands is very short. The truck yard management has been automated as well through a through a, through a management system, which allows the trucks to move in very quickly without any 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 queuing, and at the same time also avoid vehicles from idling, um, all benefiting sustainability. Then this happened. January it was. I was actually still myself. I was uh, living in China at the time, and um, it took the world by storm. It shook very quickly, actually, the international aviation. And only a few months later, the picture was like this. Travel and restrictions are closing down international aviation's market with severe restrictions cover 98% of global passenger revenues. Of, of truly gigantic proportion, I believe that it was by Violina Wood who mentioned that this hit harder than all the other pandemics. And this is actually very true. Uh, in the past, we've seen pandemics and crisis in our industry. Um, quite quickly, we, uh, we, su we survived the 9-11, also the, the, the SARS prior. We did survive the Lehman Brothers crisis. And at the same time, now entering this one, it's something a completely different animal. Where we believed that moving into the summer program of 2020, which is a start in April, we were going to have zero wide body flights between our hub here in Helsinki towards Asia or America. In the picture there on the right, you will see me and also my, uh, my, my, my current supervisor, my boss, um, where we were monitoring actually the first cargo only flight that left the 28th of March 2020 with some COVID-19 samples towards Seoul, Incheon Airport in Korea. And that's where it all started. Since then, we've been transporting uh, general cargo, medical supplies, this uh, COVID-19 PPE material, fresh fish, crabs, pharmaceuticals, um, and a lot more other products to support the logistics, the supply chains of uh, Finnish businesses, Nordic businesses, and uh, also global businesses. And um, um, what is noteworthy here is that um, in normal conditions, approximately 15% of the global air cargo has been moved with belly aircraft, belly cargo aircraft, so passenger aircraft. And now with those, a lot of these, at least at this time, still during Q2, where a lot of these aircrafts were actually grounded, the supply chains were, became greatly disrupted, and this was something that we wanted to minimize and support. One of the actions was the remodeling of one of our A330 aircrafts. And uh, this is actually how it looks on the picture on the right-hand side. You probably have seen it in some of the, some of the news. Uh, this was actually something that very quickly we decided to do when we saw that there is a demand and we need to have the ability to load more products onto the particular aircraft. Overall, in Q2, we actually flew over 600 cargo-only flights. Now, to some, that might be sounding a big number, but in normal conditions, all flights in the FINA network is 350 flights a day, so per day. And during Q2, having 600 uh, cargo-only flights might sound a little bit small next to that, but I do want to emphasize that these are wide body aircrafts and normally as well, a lot of these 350 flights per day are domestic Finland, Nordic, and also between Helsinki and continental of Europe. So this 600 is actually quite a big number. This modification of this particular aircraft was essential because there was, a, there was a lot of demand for PPE materials in, in, in Finland. So that was something that we, we wanted to provide 
as an, as an opportunity. Uh, this is one of my last slides. Um, looking at what this actually has done, I've seen that now since we are in some areas at least ramping up again in economies and, and, and this, this uh, supply chain are getting less disrupted. Um, my, my echo would be that a lot of the supply chains, and this is the, this is the signal what we understood, is that a lot of the supply chains and value chains as well are enormously long but you have the possibility to get them quicker through data. Transparency and visibility. Uh, sharing is caring, like uh, Jakob Nilhammer mentioned, and I fully support that note. With improved lead time, you have multiple of benefits. You can have better order fulfillment to your customers. You can completely revitalize your go-to-market strategy. You have less inventory, both in distribution centers and sales channels, and the tied up working capital will be reduced and is actually putting a lot of more cash into your pockets. And any customer, and I believe a lot, at least a lot of the customers that has a shorter lead time from order fulfill, order penetration to delivery will absolutely be very happy about this. So I definitely encourage you to have a look at this, especially now uh, that the competition is, is, is fierce. Um, in the past, we see that the market capacity, despite the various or disruptive elements that we've seen in our history in civil aviation, the, 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 the impacts have still been quite stable. There's been a few months of, of recovery and then we have bounced back. Um, this one might be very much different. And there might lead to instability in logistical chains uh, also in supply chains, whereas the origins and destinations might not be the same any longer, which means that the capacity that is there to build the bridges in between is getting an imbalance. And this might lead also then to price movement for uh, one or the other legs. And this is something I would also encourage each and every one to pay close attention to. Um, we might have arrived at a new normal. Logistics will always find a way and it is also shown during COVID-19 times that it will do this once more. But one thing I'd like to emphasize on is that we will find by all different suppliers here in the industry, um, they, the, the financial impact of COVID-19 is something to be taken quite seriously. And how to include potential future instability of your suppliers into a potential RFQ, and how do you protect also in the future these disruptions um, uh, for not happening again is something that I would definitely want to uh, encourage each and every one of you as you talk to your vendors in the future. I will, I'm out of time, I can tell, so I will skip the summary um, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. Uh, very insightful and uh, it's, uh, what, ha what the uh, pandemic has done to air travel and, and uh, Finnair cargo in, in, or Finnair in, in general. Uh, it's, it's a huge, uh, huge, huge disruption. Uh, and and how, how the resilience, uh, how you are facing the resilience, that's also a uh, very interesting and important issue here. Um, and we are now moving on to our last industry presentation, presentator, uh, after which there's, uh, again, a possibility to ask questions or comment and already on, and, uh, on the chat uh, box um, at the bottom of the page. But I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Olli Pohjavirka now, who is the president and CEO of, of uh, Nurminen Logistics LTD, dealing with I think mainly with the rail and road uh, logistics, and uh, he might have something to say about China as well. So uh, welcome, Mr. Pohjanvir. Yes, thank you, uh, Mario Watelova Chair and, and dear colleagues. Yeah, as we are living this COVID-19 time, despite of that, we must proceed with, with our businesses and give jobs, and deliver goods. And uh, I, I can constitute that relating to the train and rail transport, the COVID-19 has had no significant impact. In, in opposite, it has a little bit grown 
as it it's very safe it's really eco ecologically uh, has the lowest emission so far uh, so uh, and and it's very fast and 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 the pricing is moderate uh, that's why I have here stated that ecologically friendly forerunner in logistics between Northern Europe and China. And I will tell some words after more about this. Uh, yeah, some words about Nurmin. And so we are really uh, providing excellent services in rail transport, forwarding and cargo handling. Uh, we are quite old company already 100, over 130 years and listed in Helsinki Stock Exchange. And as our topics were digitalization in Nurminen, I would say some words about it. We, we have made a huge ERP program in, in, in past years. And now we are really facing the digitalization part of that. And especially with the train, our own train between Finland and China, the digitalization gives and can give a huge impact for ourselves and for our clients. As we are the only EU-based uh, train operator between fin uh, China and, and Europe and Northern Europe, so, so we have all the possibilities to try to have the most out of the digitalization in our service chain. And why it's so needed here? Of course, it's 9,000 kilometers. We have door-to-door -door services. So we have tens of uh, subcontractors. We have thousands of clients. We have four countries. And, and even more when we calculate uh, the countries around Finland. So this means that we can handle all these things. We need to have digitalization. We have to have good processes on and tools to minimize the human errors to have efficiency, to make it easy for our clients, to have analytics on, on that, to do it even better. So digitalization in this, especially transport system is very, very important. As the train is founded by many industrial groups as a very reliable part of their supply chain. And as already stated, the supply chain, when it works well, it really gives an important impact on finance, financials to our, our clients, as you can save a lot of working capital in a way that, that you have uh, smaller inventories, you can plan your production better, you can plan what you need better, you have less unneeded transport, more exact on need based transport only used so it's also very make 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 it ecologically more friendly as a small company this has of, of course been a big step for us to start the uh, connection between china to this destination in china and finland and and but what we saw five years already ago that that especially as is fast it can handle quite the big volumes. One train can take more or less like 35 big, uh, 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 big planes cargo. So, so we have in one train 50 containers. So it's quite a big volume. We can have many trains in a week. Now we are having, uh, we are planning to have next year two weeks, of, uh, two two trains a week. Now we are having one train a week from China and back back to China. And, and about the digitalization, so we have this uh, digital booking system is coming now. It, it's much more friendly for our clients. We can handle and, and plan fulfilling the train and the containers more, more and more better. It gives uh, more better service to our clients, estimations. We have a real-time monitoring system. Uh, which our clients can can look also with our temperature monitoring, uh, with our reefer containers. We have been the first European company to 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 take by train by tra rail uh, reefer cargo from European Union to China. It was a test a test flow. 
test drive and, 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 and doing a lot of first things and the digitalization of course helps here. So it makes it the processing easier for customers, less emails, phone calls, of course it's natural and um, less errors, which are very, very important thing as, as when you are traveling 9,000 kilometers plus the door-to-door -door ser services in both, both ends. So the errors are always very expensive and ecologically they made normally, they can double the emissions. So, so when you have to take the goods back and forth. So the digitalization really means that, that we can we can have less and less uh, problems to, to to resolve and and to to hit uh, at once uh, to have a good service. Here are our, our routes uh, between uh, Finland and China. So we have one station is Hefei, which is quite close to Shanghai, 400 kilometers west on Chan Shanghai, and then we have Chongqing. Uh, quite mid-China, a big, very big industrial city with auto automotive in industries. And all the trains are coming to Helsinki Wasari port, which is a very good destination where we can have easily with our, within our clients in two hours everywhere delivered almost in Finland, the cargo. The train transport takes 11 to 15 days. From Chongqing, it's 11 days. From Hefei, normally, 13 to 14 days, the transit time, it's very safe. Uh, the conditions are, are, are very stable and, 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 and we can serve both uh, uh, full loaded containers and less than container cargo. So all type of clients are, are in, in our, our services. And of course, from Helsinki port, we have good uh, destinations by sea, to everywhere in Northern Europe, very, very fast one, even, even to London or England, very, very fast by four days in addition. So, so this logistics chain is, is really giving a, one new possibility to the goods which need to have a stable, enough fast, especially very ecological way of transportation. And especially when the transportation starts more or less in mid-China. So, so this impact is, is huge. And also what comes to Finland, uh, normally we are always thinking traditionally that we are isolated somewhere. And, and, uh, and that's the fact when you look from a sea, port, sea transport point of view. So we are normally the last, last port in the chain. But with the train, we actually we are the first one. We are in a pole position, as you say, in Formula One. So we are the closest to China and we can really utilize it. And the second big thing is that we have a ra same railway gauge as, as uh, Russia and Kazakhstan have. So, so it's it's very efficient way of, of doing transport. And so far 87% of this 9,000 or closely 9,000 kilometers are electrified and the, Remaining 13% is all also under the, under the way of being an, uh, electrified. So, so it's it's really a ecologically very friendly friendly route, which is very 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 important. Uh, here are some of the benefits which we can see not only for ourselves uh, for improving our work by digitalization, but especially for our clients. So the digital supply chain, we can see here huge possibilities. And we have already now have clients who have shifted their part of their production from China to Finland because of this train connection. So they can have more easier, uh, more on needs uh, component deliveries to Finland, have a, have a production in Finland in European Union and sell when to export from Finland again, the ready-made goods. So this is, one way how a new supply chain works when, when it's very stable, enough fast, and especially ecologically friendly. Uh, better customer experience by digitalization. So our clients, they can really monitor where the goods are going. So they can see 
where a container is moving along this 9,000 kilometers. Uh, we have a uh, information, so so we can we can plan, as I already said, the trains the better, the continent of the, of of, the, of the containers better, and to analyze the market better. Automatization, of course, gives profitability, especially for clients who don't have huge volumes. And here we are speaking, of course, e-commerce growing companies who don't have millions of tons of goods. So with the train, they can have one container, two container, three container, or one pallet. Quite cost efficiency, especially when we are speaking about uh, uh, <clears throat> consumer goods. So the ecological side, CO2 emissions are very important in their selling species and in, 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 in responsibilities, because now more and more companies are really taking this serious. So we, we can provide them with a calculator of CO2 emissions in the future. So they can really show to their customers how, they are, how their whole supply chain and the whole business is working and what is the real emission level in their products. And of course, digitalization gives less human errors, and that means less damages and less ecological impact. So that's also a very important factor here. And better planning for every, everybody. And in the future, of course, for us, we can analyze, we can make our service better, we can utilize it better, we can have for ourselves better margins, of course, at the same time when our clients will have better margins. So it's like win-win situation. So the benefits are huge with the rail traffic in the future. The volumes are really growing. And there are a lot of goods who has been waiting on this kind of service method, transport method to, to, to be launched, which really works safely and the timetables are kept. The tra threats here, what we can see for this kind of, uh, of transportation, digitalization and all this, are of course, that we really require skillful people. And that's of course what the European Union and Finland of course has to take into account when we are looking what kind of education we have to provide, what, what kind of uh, new things to, to, to be learned for, for employees which are already uh, working. So this is really important thing as because we can already now see that there is lack of many, many, many of these talents, especially in logistics fairs. Of course, one thing is this international trade wars, treaties, what is the future of them? Because this is really important, of course, how the treaties, how the global economy and how the big nations will cooperate. This is really important. And it comes directly to the doc documentation, the digitalization, because if there is no real treaties, uh, with, with this multi-party treaties, not only bilateral treaties. So, so it's quite difficult to go forward with the digitalization, what comes to the documentation and bureaucracy. So we really hope that, that the digitalization, as we know, we can proceed, but at the same time, the states, European Union, China, US, they will find a way to have treaties on this to, to really go forward with the documentation part that it will be digitalized between the states. So this is shortly my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olli. And uh, uh, now we've heard uh, our industry presentations uh, covering all the uh, different transport modes uh, and, and their insights on the pandemic. And uh, it seems that different modes have been affected quite differently, in fact. Um, now we have a, a short time to uh, reflect on these industry presentations before short industry pitches. Uh, would somebody have uh, a question or a comment to our previous speakers? 
or would like to reflect on the uh, on the themes. We have now um, uh, a, qu a question from uh, Lassenikanen about uh, the Russian authorities. How how have the Russian authorities helped the China train transit transport? I think that would be to Mr. Olli Pohjanvirta. Yes, thank you for the question because it's it's quite many time times raised by our clients because we can see yeah we work with China and we work with Finland but what about Russia? So the Russia is very, very uh, pro on this uh, way of transport. They are really supporting this transport route. Uh, it's really a key thing with the Russian railways to go forward with the, even with the digitalization. So, so between Finland and, and, and Russia, we have even now all kind of projects on documentationally, but we can do everything by digitalization. So. We have to, of course, combine China into here. But with Russian authorities, there is no, not at all, any problems. They are really cooperative, and they have put a lot of efforts on this uh, rail traffic between China and Europe. And, and as we have our trains to Finland today, so there are much more trains which are going today from China to Germany, directly through Poland. So, so this is a already a huge transport corridor which we are speaking and the Russians are very supportive here as well as the Kazakhs. Kazakhs. Thank you. Uh, are there any other comments or questions maybe? Or would our speakers like to reflect on the topic of maybe uh, multimodality? At least I see that this is not a, uh, the whole, whole uh, traffic system is, our uh, transport system is not uh, based on one modality, but it's, uh, it's oh, fair to I, say that it's definitely multimodal. Yes, I can add that, of course, we don't have only train between Wasari and, 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 and Hefe or, or to Chongqing, it's not enough. So it's, of course, multimodal. So. We can add, as I already said, from Buasari, uh, sea, sea freights through Buasari port or for, from Turku port to, to with, with trucks uh, for, forward to Europe. And in China, of course, the destinations are plenty of them. So we are using mainly train, electrified trains in China, but of course, trucking. And of course, we are looking the combination for our clients. So if we, if we have a really client who needs to have air cargo, so we are telling that now for these goods, it's better you use air cargo. So of course it's multimodal when you try to serve your client in the best way. So definitely it's, it's not a, a contest between different uh, models of transport. It's, it's means of transport. It's really a combination to find the best solution. Yes, absolutely. And uh, reflecting on the kind of cargo that uh, would, would be needed to uh, take from one place to another, it's definitely, uh, let's say, if you have a, a load of uh, fresh fish, there would be the time would be the, the essential quality then. And, and then you would choose the transport mode based on the, the need, need of the cargo. So would would uh, would there be a specific kind of cargo uh, for the for the rail between China and Finland or, or China and EU? I think there was, uh, the specific kind of cargo. Uh, I think the main uh, cargo what we have today is really a cargo which, let's say, the sea freight it's too long. Maybe the conditions in Indian oceans are not always the best ones for the cargo. And uh, the punctuality of the delivery is very important. And when you speak about air cargo, normally you, have, you are in a really hurry. You don't have a big volume. And the cargo is very, very uh, expensive one. So, so the train is between of those normally. So we have a cargo which is much more expensive than needs to go by sea 
and we have a cargo which goes to inland in China many times and needs stable uh, transportation uh, conditions and exact timing. And, but it don't need to be in place within two days. So, and, and it has bigger volumes when we air cargo. So normally it, it can be, you know, from one, one client, he has three containers, for example, or two containers. So, so, so it's, 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 I wouldn't say that there is some specific, uh, real specific cargo for trains, but the main common thing is that it's, it's enough expensive that it's useless to have it two months waiting in the sea, sea freight because people need money. It's, it's in the production uh, planning and so forth. So it's all kind of cargo. So we are really having all kind of cargo going going through and a lot of clients and, and not only Finnish clients. So it's, 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 it's one new method with, which has been needed, we can see it. Yes, thank you. And we have uh, a couple of questions related to could the China trains feed Finna flight cargo and how do you see the use of Silk Route in future? But uh, I see also that uh, Frederick Wildgruber has a, has a hand up. So uh, would you like to reflect before? Thank you. Yes, very much. And uh, I'd like to uh, to just um, uh, agree with uh, Oli Pohja Virta, what he mentioned, that this is not the battle of the transportation modes. Um, I'd like to turn the focus, if you want to call it a battle or at least a competition, towards supply chains. Because in, yeah. in, in business, we have been promoting differentiation into the products and services but there is less focus of differentiation actually into the supply chains and as we can see that through e-commerce and 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 a lot of open channels product availability is global and the competition of different products is actually becoming more easier and easier the competition of supply chain and market reach is actually starting to be a very important point. I just like to acknowledge that when you order something online yourself, would you lie if the price is the same? Do you choose the delivery option, which is two days, or the one that is 14 days? So Absolutely. the differentiation here is something that it's, uh, and, and I also would like to take the note on the different uh, products that you would want to inject in the various of modes. We often see that it could be a perishable product, something that couldn't survive a long journey. But also, like Oli Bohjavirta mentioned, is that it could be a very expensive product. So fin financing is actually a very crucial part of the element in what transportation mode you use. If you would in instance think that you would put in a very expensive product out in the ocean, someone has to finance also the journey. And uh, exactly. at, that, at that point in time, there are usually very few interesting, interested parties that put their hands up that I'd like to pay for this. So with, with, with that, I only, again, want to leave with the thought that have a think about this. How could your supply chain compete towards other supply chains? And could you turn that into competitive advantage? Thank you. Thank yeah, you. This, this is a very you. important factor of financing and the competitive edge, uh, what Europe should have because anyway, the Asian market is growing faster than the traditional Western market. So we have to find the ways how we can compete, utilize each other. And, and, and the transportation is actually one of the things which you have to think more. Now it's all the more, most often, often you think thought only as an expense, but actually you have to turn it vice versa and think what you can gain from doing it better thinking from the financing point of view, from the right shipment point of view to, to, to have less inventory. And when you have big inventory, you have always big losses because some components will, will have a last date. You know, you don't anymore make that product. So this kind of combination and all kind of transportation means gives you much more than only thinking about price per ton. That's really old fashioned. And, and what I would like to ask, as, at least from a Finnish perspective to look, so we can have a really special combination in Finland with air cargo, Finnair having the best solution by air, the best aircrafts. We are having the tri uh, direct uh, bone train from China. 
to China and, and we have very good seaports here. So we can really have a good hub for Europe, even for in the coming years for UK, who knows, is it Europe or not? And even to US, it's, it's quite fast route anyway to east coast of US. So this is really big thinking what we have to think. Exactly. Uh, I'm, um, there's also a, a, a one comment from Jako Nirhamo before we go to our industry pitches and, and end up end up this day. Actually, actually uh, I noticed that uh, last, Mr. Lasse Nykänen has uh, questions for all panelists and attendees also. Uh, yes. So, so I, 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 okay, please do. Can I, can I, can I ask everybody to uh, maybe answer to the chat box? Okay, good. So that we can move on to the uh, industry pitches and then uh, wrap up this day. So please uh, join the chat as well while we are here and, and answer uh, or comment uh, from your point of view. Thank you. So now I'd like to uh, move on to uh, the industry pitches. Uh, first of which uh, we will hear uh, Ms. Uh, Nora Lahde from the Ministry of Transport and Communications. The floor is yours. Welcome, Nora. I hope Nora is here. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I am. I am here. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah, now I opened also the camera. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's it's uh, great, uh, great to meet you all. And uh, thank you also for the invitation for this uh, webinar. It has been uh, great to recognize uh, Class Nordic as an active collaboration forum working towards the digital and green corridors. So yeah, my name is uh, Nora Lahde, and I'm working in the Ministry of Transport and uh, Communication uh, in data department as a special advisor. Uh, and my special focus uh, are in data digitalization and automation related questions uh, in the ministry. And for the next slide, please. And actually I can, yeah. All right, so my bit is uh, pitch is about uh, logistics digitalization strategy, uh, which uh, we just finalized on 5th of uh, October, so a few weeks ago. So a few words about the background of the strategy. So the objective uh, was to define the vision and uh, targets and the measures to be taken to promote the digitalization, uh, digitalization in logistics. Uh, and at the same time uh, to find the efficiency targets. So especially the climate benefits of digitalization, uh, the functionality, efficiency and the safety of transport chains. So uh, not only uh, to uh, boost the digitalization, uh, but at the same time to find uh, the all, all uh, uh, good benefits there. Uh, and the initiative uh, was drawn up in uh, 2018, uh, where there was the need to strengthen the logistics and uh, transport sector, especially in terms uh, of digitalization, uh, and uh, to uh, widen it to the nodes such as uh, ports, terminals, uh, airports, so the whole uh, transport chain. Uh, the project decision international level was approved last uh, August, so last year's August. And uh, from uh, the last August, the work to form the strategy started. And uh, it has been um, comprised together uh, with the uh, network uh, of the logistic digitalization uh, players. Uh, so the strategy was released a few weeks ago, like I mentioned. Okay, uh, and for the region, uh, which you can uh, see here, uh, it, it comprised, uh, the core comprised that the infrastructure, logistics and data are enabling a seamless uh, ensemble along transport corridors. And with digitalization, Finland is moving towards efficient and sustainable logistics. And how this can be reached? Uh, well, first of all, 
uh, it's uh, essential to focus on the data utilization. So to have uh, the smaller as well as bigger um, organizations access for data uh, in, in order to create the efficient chains. Uh, and the information flow should be uh, like should be flowed through national and international corridors and nodes, and really essential uh, to reduce uh, the climate impacts of logistics uh, with different means such as optimizing streamlining. And this is really requiring <laughs> uh, collaboration. There should be one slide more. Yeah, but it's somehow, yeah. Okay, so last slide. Uh, so the collaboration is the key. So the actions uh, uh, between uh, different stakeholders is, is really important to find the common targets. Uh, and earlier uh, it was mentioned, for example, the DEP program, the Digital Europe program. Uh, but uh, I would like to mention also the Horizon 2020 program uh, as uh, the project, uh, the new opening of the project will uh, foreseen to open at the beginning of 2021. Uh, and there uh, is an emphasis uh, for the digitalization related uh, part uh, together, together with the uh, sustainability tar targets. Uh, and also connected to the uh, data spaces, which was all also uh, mentioned earlier today. So this is uh, like one uh, opportunity which could be taken into an account. But I only had three minutes and I guess it went a little <laughs> bit more sorry about that, but this was in short. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I know that people tend to get carried away. Uh, and and um, so I, I uh, I'm very sorry that we only have three minutes, three minutes uh, uh, for each industry pitches. So we move on to uh, and thank you, Nora Lahde from the Ministry of Transport and Communications of Finland. And we we move on to Mr. Ilka Salone from Citowise. Floor is yours. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. I will shortly. Do I have the presentation? Yes, there. Okay. I will shortly, shortly tell you about our company, Citowise LTD. And I, I have only two slides. First slide deals with, with uh, Citowise and our services uh, as a whole. And the second slide concentrates on, on, the, on our services in the logistics field. So, on the right hand side you can see some basic facts of our company nowadays we employ more than 1900 uh, experts most of them are working in finland but some of them are working working abroad in sweden norway latvia estonia poland so we have subsidiaries there and one thing I should mention, we are the largest Finnish-owned company in our business field. And as far as I remember, CITO was established uh, in year 1976. So we have quite long history here. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see our doings, what we do. We do cons consultancy, planning, design, development, research, studies, simulation, optimization, management. So we have very diverse doings. And the fields we are, we are uh, doing our businesses is shown also in the slides. We do smart solutions and information systems, geographical information systems, uh, passenger traffic, transport traffic and terminal infrastructure, construction, building, environment, waste, recycling, logistics, supply chain management. So you can see, see this 
areas our services are targeted to. But of course, under these uh, areas, there are many, many tailored uh, individual services to different clients. But these are our doings at company level. But in next slide, please, uh, you can see our main areas of services in logistics. We have divided these services in two main segments or areas. The first segment is transport and logistic research and development. And the, uh, another one is consultancy and simulations. Uh, in the first segment, the clients are mainly public uh, organizations and authorities from regional level to European Union level. And uh, we have uh, compiled uh, very many logistics and transport studies and developed monitoring indicators, indicators in many projects at state level and uh, regional level and European Union level also. also. Uh, as an example, I can mention the research and modeling of hinterlands of the Finnish ports and the updates indicator development and in that project. Also, we have conducted many projects related to green logistic solutions and action plans for promote green logistics uh, in different areas of Finland. Also, we do emission calculation calculations. That is one one uh, main things we do at the moment. And uh, city logistics, we have been uh, in many projects. As an example, we have uh, been consultant in in the uh, action plan for. Uh, city logistics uh, for for the city of Helsinki. Modeling and scenario building. Uh, as an example, we are uh, maintaining the emis emission calculation and scenario models of Finnish maritime transports. And there is update ongoing at the moment. Smart logistics mm -hmm. projects. And then we can move move to an, another main segment of services we offer consultancy and simulations. So we we offer this uh, simulation optimization cons consultancy of logistics and transport operations, transport chains, and also the pr uh, processes of supply chains, and at Pyroscope supply networks. Development of di digital twins, and we can build different kind of uh, tools, solutions, uh, simulations on the top, on top of these these platforms, uh, and the development of and simulation of planning environments for testing different alternative solutions, and like we all know, the simulation is very cheap way to test test uh, uh, different solutions to develop uh, supply chains and, uh, and uh, logistics uh, functions. Uh, and our clients in this segment uh, are, are mostly in the private sector, paper forest industry, mining in the industry, energy sector, etc. So, thank you for all here. Thank you very much, uh, Ilka, from, from Citawise. And then we move, move on to uh, Estonia and welcome Mr. Mari Sassiat from Ghostwith. Welcome. Hello, uh, I'm Madis. Uh, I'm from Ghostwift. And uh, if there is any. Uh... Ah, here it is. So in a coronavirus world, it's important to control borders, borders and keep goods moving. So GoSwift allows you to keep traffic flowing in the most safe 
and efficient way possible. Goes with this uh, scheduling system that ensures truck, trucks arrive on time. Imagine uh, how much time and money you would save if all the trucks could arrive exactly on time in perfect order. So what is what GoSuite can do for companies right now? Um, to, uh, because of uh, uh, coronavirus, there is additional checks and barriers to make sure goods can flow safely. This has the communication problems leading the cars and queues uh, and, and uh, uh, at the gates and the entrance. This wastes everyone time uh, and the driver, the carrier and the customer. So uh, GoSwift achieves uh, this um, using by uh, uh, an all-in-one inbound logistics scheduling system, uh, which connects vehicle and terminal traffic management and uh, exchanges information seamlessly with uh, minimum human interaction. So uh, GoSwift has been keeping European traffic flowing for almost 10 years. So here is uh, what GoSwift looks like if you want to book a lorry on the ferry from Helsinki to Tallinn. And uh, if you run a ferry terminal, uh, for example, like this one, this is how can customize, you can customize your data collection. And if you match a fleet of lorries, uh, this is the real-time traffic uh, information your drivers would see as they head for the destination. So what can uh, GoSwift uh, work for you? If you are matching a fleet of vehicles, GoSwift gives you, for example, remote registration, dynamic time management, hassle-free navigation, uh, drivers can still use uh, their own preferred navigation app, like, for example, Google Maps. And then uh, the driver uh, or truck arrives. There is a fast loading as everything is ready and booked for the truck. And if you are managing freight coming in, in and out of a busy site, because it gives you time slot delegation, gate assistant with a stop bar control and number plate readers, parking management, loading space and resource management. So GoSwift is also developing a new technology based on cosmic rays, which is surrounding all, us all the time. In a minute, uh, there is uh, around 10,000 muons going through the human body without making any harm to the health. So here you can see uh, how new security checks will be held in the future. And it makes possible even to detect if a person is infected by the COVID uh, or any other lung disease. So uh, I think that uh, this is the, uh, kind of a, a very essential and very uh, easy, uh, un uh, very, very short presentation about the GoShift and our technologies and, and solutions that we have here. So if you have uh, something which made uh, interest to you, so please contact with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maris from, uh, from GoSwift. And then we swiftly go on uh, to our last pitch, uh, Ms. Ira Othman from Vedia Pai. Welcome, Ira. Floor is yours. And can you unmute yourself, maybe? Yes, this helps. <laughs> thank you very much, Mayu. And first of all, I would like to um, thank all the speakers and panelists that have been joining our webinar today. It was very, very interesting. And um, now I would like to quickly introduce um, Vedia uh, to you and our Vedia Cars Universe. Um, Vedia is an value adding service provider and here you can see our service portfolio um, which consists of first video drive and one of the pro products inside is the e-seals second is the carbon house third is the cvw which is the clean vehicle wizard and video Klaus. and um what, what we've been thinking or what we've been working on when we have these disrupted corridors is how can we actually find new opportunities in them and how can we use the time that we are in in order to make best out of it. Um, okay. 
So first of all, I would like to introduce you to CAS ECL, one of the um, main projects that we are currently working on. And um, the, the, the overview is that um, since COVID-19 is disrupting international freight transports right now, CAS ECL is a very good solution to overcome the obstacles that this puts in our way. CAS ECL um, enhances the fully automated border crossing uh, process and it's a new generation of a seal which enables supply chain transparency. So the CAS e-seal is uh, allowing us to have a transparent um, border crossing process since the cargo is monitored, it's location independent and it's safe and secure and therefore tamper proof. So the idea is to replace the traditional passive e seals with active e-seals and e-seals can be used in either transit shipments, high value shipments, crossing and especially EU uh, border crossing shipments and it also it's flexible to air, road, sea and rail transportation. So this is one way how we see um, the disruption of corridors also lighting up new opportunities, for example, um, putting into place the e-seal. And another tool that I would like to introduce you to is um, that still topic of sustainability is really, really important for logistics industry, even though we have right now other topics that are high on the list. And with our tool of CVW, Clean Vehicle Visit, we would like to um, step into um, the focus of logistics emission. So since there is EU-wide regulation now to promote clean mobility, um, and national targets for public procurement are um, set, um, for example, 2021 new ob uh, obligations for public procurement and uh, public fleets are taking into um, account then 2025, um, the targets of fleets emissions being very much lowered and 2030 zero emission fleets requirements. Um, the CVW clean vehicle visit tool um, helps um, public authorities to monitor monitor emissions and their public procurement. We are very happy to announce that we have already some pilots of the CVW running in Finland and we are also um, looking out to establish this in other countries and CVW is our solution towards cleaner tomorrow. Thank you very much for listening to our small company bridge and um, yeah thank you very much Mayu for hosting so far. Thank you, Ira, uh, from Vediapai from the, for the last industry pitch. And uh, thank you, everybody who is uh, still joining us. Uh, and uh, for the last words, I'd like to just encourage us, every one of us, to collaborate towards uh, more resilient, more efficient, more sustainable multimodal transport corridors. And uh, uh, although I'm wrapping up this event right now, and I'm very uh, thankful for your attention, uh, there's still some minutes if any of uh, any one of you would like to raise some questions or comments or uh, so feel free to do it, but also feel free to uh, move on with your uh, your afternoon in other chores. Thank you on my behalf.